And welcome back to our Haystack uh, TV stream today. Uh, so our second talk is from Tim Allison. Uh, Tim has been working in natural language processing since 2002. And the last few years, his focus has shifted to uh, around content extraction, advanced search and relevance tuning. Tim, it, Tim is currently working at the uh, Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory at the California Institute of Technology. And he is also a member of the Apache Software Foundation, the chair of Apache Tika, committer in Apache Open NLP, Apache Solar, Apache PDF Box, and Apache POI. And in a former life, he was a professor of Latin and Greek. So I can think we can we can safely say he uh, he knows a lot about stuff. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Tim. Tim's going to be talking today about genetic algorithms and random search for finding optimal parameters for relevance ranking. Tim. Great. Thank you so much, Charlie. Uh, and thank you to the organizers of Berlin Buzzwords and Haystack and Mices uh, for bringing off a fantastic uh, set of talks uh, and uh, colloquiums. Uh, I've, I've had a lot of fun, so thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit, uh, yeah, first a little bit about me. Charlie's gone over uh, some of the details. Uh, some of you may have seen some of my work on Tika. Uh, so the other important point about this talk uh, before I really get going is that uh, some of this work initially, as with all uh, 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 evolving things, uh, evolved from uh, earlier work at uh, my former employer at the MITRE Corporation. So some of these slides are under copyright with them. So I will be talking today about Tika, Tika, and more Tika. No, I'm joking, um, but seriously, that's not why we're here today. We are here today instead to talk about uh, genetic algorithms uh, and evolving uh, uh, ways of improving search. So I'll start off with the uh, introduction and motivation for what I, uh, for, for my evolution. Uh, I'll talk about some of the methods uh, that I developed, uh, and I'll end with some uh, some some findings uh, of, of re recent findings. All right, so first I had tip to Simon Hughes, uh, who uh, spoke about um, uh, evolving uh, relevancy uh, back in 2016. Uh, before him, others had, tried, had also experimented with this. Um, it's a, a fun uh, area to work. Um, I will say that I did not get involved with this particular uh, set of algorithms because uh, I thought it was necessarily the best tool uh, to use, uh, but rather it's something that I kind of evolved into and it just seemed like an easy next step to take. Uh, so I'll share some of the, some of the work on that uh, today and uh, off we go. All right, so uh, we now know uh, there is a, a chorus of, of uh, open source relevance tools uh, as was announced uh, yesterday, two days ago. Um, so that's the combination of Cupid, uh, RRE, Quirky, um, and Smooey. Um, that is uh, all a suite of really useful tools. And I'm, I'm, I was really gratified to see that they're placed into a single uh, framework uh, to some degree so that you can have a nice toolkit for a number of different um, areas. The reason that I started working with Quirate or building it uh, initially was before those had all been put together. And also I felt that uh, there wasn't quite something out there that allowed me to do what I wanted to. And I'll talk about some of the differences between what my little tool can do and uh, what some of the other uh, tools can do. And hopefully um, once my stuff matures more, uh, there could be room for it, maybe in chorus, um, we will see. Uh, but I, I do look forward to collaborating, whether that's simply transferring of ideas, uh, knowledge, um, findings, uh, and so on. Uh, whether it's actual code or not, not, not a big concern for me. All right, so why even bother with this? First off, of course, as we all know, search is easy. It's solved, uh, so we shouldn't be here. Is that laughter I hear from around the world, even though everybody, uh, nobody's, nobody can speak in this channel? Of course, uh, search is not easy. Um, and we all know that Google makes it look easy. So we have the uphill battle of trying to explain to people why it's not, especially on site search and uh, intranet search. Uh, thank you, Charlie, uh, for this um, a beautiful diagram. Uh, for folks in this audience, uh, you already know uh, that the, the components of a search system. Uh, search is uh, not easy. There are lots of different areas for tuning uh, and lots of various areas for things to go wrong. Um, so we're trying to figure out where to focus one's energy, trying to explore the parameter space to understand how your uh, components are working together to yield uh, high quality results uh, can be challenging, uh, especially when the parameter space is so big. 
Speaking of which, um, as of, this is somewhat dated, but I don't think it's changed too much. Uh, so this is, these are some available parameters um, just within uh, kind of conventional uh, solar, um, and I say conventional to differentiate from uh, Trey's talk uh, and all of the um, topics he was talking about, which are fantastic um, on the thought vectors and the dense vectors and uh, all of that uh, fun stuff and the knowledge graphs. Before you even get to that, um, within solar and within Elasticsearch, you have all of the different tokenizers you can use. You have all of the different token filters. And as we all know, you can stack them on top of each other. Order matters. Um, you have different query parsers. You can boost all sorts of different things. You can do phrasal boosting and shingling. Um, you can do minimum should match. Uh, you can do um, token or field-based scoring, best fields, most fields. You can have synonym lists, taxonomies. Um, and thanks, uh, shout out to Erica for an awesome talk on that. Um, and some of the complexities with those. Uh, obviously, you can also uh, now manipulate the uh, scoring parameters in BM25 uh, in the Lucene ecosystem. Elevate file for solar, alternate methods to do that in Elasticsearch, external signal enrichment. Um, so lots of different things to do with that, including um, analysis of query logs, all sorts of other things there. And then, of course, finally at the bottom, I get around to um, re-ranking uh, via uh, machine learning, uh, whether that's learning to rank uh, or other things. And of course, as um, Trey pointed out in his talk just earlier, there are all sorts of other ways of um, measuring similarity, including with the dense vectors. Uh, so it, it's the, the number of parameters we have to uh, play with is, is rather uh, astounding. And let's not forget, I, I love this one, that each token filter can have its own a whole bunch of parameters. Um, so the, 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 the parameter space is just enormous, as we all know. So what to do, what to do. Uh, for this conference, uh, I don't need to um, mention, uh, go out and buy that book if you haven't already, go get two copies. Uh, it's a really, really nice way of uh, thinking about how to craft uh, the relevant signal uh, from um, with, with various techniques and how to layer different types of relevance uh, to achieve uh, what you're trying to do. One of my takeaways in that book, and it was absolutely um, foundational to my work with uh, relevance uh, and relevance tuning, but one thing that I found didn't quite work for me uh, in the context I was working in is that the one-off queries or the optimizing for individual queries here and there didn't have the systemic approach that I wanted for some of the clients I was working with at the time and, and now. Um, so that book has a really nice, in my opinion, has a really nice set of basics and wit tools and ways of training and, um, and, and tuning uh, systems. Uh, but I wanted to go a little bit uh, beyond that into seeing how we can make changes that uh, that have an effect across a, a broader swath of queries. Um, yeah. So the other thing, uh, yeah, and also thank you, Doug and John, uh, for permission to use the search engineer uh, image in, in this talk. All right. So what I'll be focusing on now, obviously, there are, in, in my mind, there are about three, at least three kind of high-level categories for uh, evaluating uh, how well a search system is doing. Um, there's uh, user uh, feedback uh, and there are various type flavors of that. Uh, then there are how people are actually using your system uh, and doing you know, click through analysis, uh, um, yeah, conversion, all of that stuff. And then the third is when you have ground truth based uh, relevance uh, tuning. For this audience, I don't have to talk about how important it is to have good ground truth. Um, you all know that. People have given talks on it. Uh, it's very hard to do good ground truth. Uh, and also, I very much appreciated um, Jetro and uh, Byron's talk on uh, the importance of measurement uh, and walking into organizations that had no measurement uh, and complained that the search is awful. Uh, and then, you know, you do have to start building up the sense that you have to be able to measure against something. But I sing to the, to the choir here. Uh, it, so I'll stop with that. Um, if you do want a good laugh, uh, do check out the uh, tanks link uh, and uh, problems with overfitting, uh, especially when ground truth is expensive. Uh, overfitting is a very serious risk uh, in that you can appear to get better performance numbers, uh, but then in practice, uh, performance uh, might get worse uh, or it certainly won't see the benefits that you would expect to see based on your experiments if you don't have a careful uh, separation of uh, train and test. All right. So ground truth, uh, we all know what this looks like to some degree. Um, so, you know, you have uh, some kind of relevance ranking, a doc ID and uh, a query. 
For uh, Quirita, uh, and I should step back, uh, Quirita is uh, Latin, uh, it means search, as in um, seek and you shall find the truth. Uh, it's a uh, plural imperative, uh, so with Quirita, it's the notion is search, find those, but not actual search search, but search in the parameter space for what sets of parameters, what combinations of technologies uh, can help lead to uh, improved results. So the workflow at this point is, um, mm -hmm. Hacky, uh, it starts off with a, a command line uh, and a ground truth file, which I already explained, experiments, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, pumps those into a little H2 database and then launches those queries against uh, those queries in those experiments against solar or elastic search, and then outputs uh, a directory of reports. Um, so yes, that is my user interface, uh, just a series of CSV files. I'm sorry, that's where I am. Uh, if anybody wants to contribute um, or if anybody wants to help me integrate this into another project, do let me know. Um, front ends are not my thing. All right, so some of the components, uh, the, I, the the main part of, of, of this is in core, obviously. CLI is where the experiments and the um, command line uh, code is. The thing that people might find useful, if we've all done this before, is have a unified um, interface to talk to Elastic or Solar for at least those areas where they agree, which is a whole bunch, um, so that I can say, you know, give me a connector to Solar or Elastic. The connector figures out what version it is, applies the right uh, connector so that you can send documents for indexing, uh, or you can do querying and other things across those different uh, uh, systems uh, without having to do specific stuff and change the dependencies. Um, so that's been one component that might be useful for others uh, that I think is kind of nice because you can copy stuff from an Elasticsearch 2 index to an Elasticsearch 7 index without using the actual Elastic client, which is based on one of those versions, um, or you can go from solar to Elastic easily. So that's a kind of side benefit uh, of, this, of this project. I would also encourage people to check out the examples directory and the examples um, readme on, um, on the GitHub page that walks you through how to um, run experiments and so on. So that's kind of structurally uh, where it is. There, I put in a, a, a placeholder for logs. I don't have any log analysis now, but I'm hoping to build that out, um, hopefully uh, uh, with, with others. All right, so what I found myself doing and why I, I came to this is that um, I had some ground truth, uh, which was nice to have. Uh, that is, for this client, I think I had about 600 um, queries uh, and, uh, and judgments uh, for documents. Um, and I had all of Solar available to me. So I started you know, playing with um, changing the various features and seeing if I could bump the scores from their baseline. Um, but what I found as I was twiddling with things is that I wasn't keeping track of what I was doing. Uh, I wasn't um, uh, do, approaching things in a, in a system, systematic way. Um, and the output wasn't standardized. I was focused on one um, on evaluation metric and I wanted more diversity in those. Um, so this is basically boredom and a need for uh, reproducibility and consistency um, is what got me to where I am here. So the key components for running experiments in Quirite are scores. Um, so you have an array of different types of scoring that you can do, uh, and then a map of uh, experiments. And I'll go into each of those uh, in detail now. So the scores have uh, implemented um, in, uh, NDCG, um, a number of other things that uh, various clients found useful, uh, one of which I call at least one at N, uh, which means that you got at least one of the target um, documents at one or at five or at 10 or so on, um, but also some of the other traditional precision recall and so on. Um, and then there are also, uh, you can specify experiments uh, where you have which server you're hitting uh, and then what kind of query, uh, how you want to shape that query. Um, so this is a kind of a high level view of what that experiment um, JSON file looks like. Um, yeah, so you can have at least one at N uh, in combination with NDCG and you'll get all of those results. Uh, I also have um, some really rudimentary things like a uh, number of zero results, total docs returned and so on. So you get a pretty uh, broad sense of what, um, uh, how, how you're performing and you, you can see all of these scores uh, in, for each experiment with only one run. All right, so in slightly more detail, experiments, uh, this is, as you can tell, a uh, solar um, query. So th this experiment says, boost title 10, uh, boost cast 2, give me a tie of 0 0.8, and so on. Um, I also want to do some phrasal boosting. So this, you can, you, what's nice is that you can specify this. You have the JSON around so that you can um, tie specific experiments to specific outputs um, and, and, and move forward and actually make progress. 
The output is pretty straightforward. Uh, those Excel files, this is one of them. It's just the per query per experiment score. So here we have a query of contact. Um, the experiment is called text and. And we have how many documents had at least one at, uh, at, least one, at uh, one, uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain for that query in that experiment, total docs returned, and so on. The other thing I do is then do roll-ups of those uh, statistics. So uh, for the experiment text, uh, minimum match two, um, how many had uh, at least one at, at one? Um, how, what was the um, uh, mean uh, normalized discounted cumulative gain? What was the median? What was the standard deviation? And I, one of the uh, things I'd like to can, can, uh, share is that what I don't often see in talks, uh, and this, I know people are doing this on the inside, but please let's talk about more as a community, is, is looking at the standard deviations, uh, looking at the means, um, because sometimes those are kind of crazy, and if you don't apply you know, basic um, uh, significance tests and other things, it's not clear that you're actually seeing an improvement. And I recognize the difference between significance and uh, operate, uh, statistical significance and operational significance. And I also recognize um, that statistical significance is maybe not as uh, useful uh, as uh, some want it to be, or as we all used to think it was, but still having some metric uh, to understand how big those differences are is, is really uh, critical. And I'd like to try to share that and get that out to the degree that it's not, to the, to the degree that it needs to be. Lots of folks, as I said, are already um, well ahead of me on, on these topics. But then the third type of output is uh, I do pairwise um, p-value differences between the experiments. So this says that um, you know, the experiment text uh, minimum should match two. Uh, the p-value difference between that and text stem is 0 0.94, which means there's no statistical significance, statistically significant difference between those. Um, and you can see that as you move down, um, the, the statistical significance goes up, um, but it's still nothing in this uh, little uh, ground truth set, this little uh, play set uh, that I worked with. All right, so that was generation zero where I wanted replicability, I wanted um, automaticity for those experiments, I just wanted to be able to run stuff, get the results back in a standardized format. But then I thought, why am I sitting here generating those experiments when we have all of those features? I'm basically kind of lazy as we all, as all coders are, and why can't we just get the computer to generate those experiments? So that was uh, that was kind of my second step in um, in this evolution towards evolutionary algorithms was getting um, specifying parameter sets and then allowing uh, the computer to generate the, um, the the full set of of experiments that, that one can launch. And the other thing, um, of course, is that you you know you can as as I point here with with the number of coffee and, and this uh, relevance engineer. There is, there's, there's a large parameter space. So you can have different analyzer chains. Um, you can have field boost and field ranges. Um, you know, you can have Boolean, minch and match type, PF, PF2, PF3, um, PS, uh, the phrasal slop, and all of those things. You can do boost. By the time you add in all of those things and generate all of the experiments with all of the combinations, you are definitely in the area at, at risk of, of overfitting. It's possible and it's useful to do that sometimes, um, but you have to be really careful that uh, you're, you're to avoid overfitting. That's what led me into some other things. So, all right, yeah, so this is uh, what can happen with, um, with, this is what the feature factories look like. Um, so instead of the experiments, we have feature factories. So you can have different URLs, so you can send queries to different uh, servers, which may have different configurations on them. Um, and you, you specify ranges. Uh, so what fields do I wanna use for any Dismax query? Uh, what kind of weight, what weight ranges do I wanna have? Um, how many fields do I want to have? If I only wanna try you know, one um, field or two fields or three fields, different tie variables, uh, values, and uh, uh, query operator values, and so on. So the, just this combination, when you do all of the permutations, uh, generates 390 experiments. The other fun thing I added was parameterizable strings, um, which means that you can take this boost, which is a recency boost, um, and you can see in the, as you can obviously tell from me pointing my screen what I'm pointing to, um, the you can take the one, two, three, um, and then have those uh, boost together uh, at, at the same way. So your range is saying, I want to range at that point in the formula of one or two or three, and then I want the next value to be exactly the same as, as the first. So you can do some pretty uh, complex uh, parameter parameterizing um, to specify different types of experiments and different, uh, different ranges of experiments. But as you can tell, if you do all the permutations, you get permutation explosion. Um, yeah, if you have seven fields, you get up to 2,000 
um, experiments when you have two weights. So that's why I moved into as a natural evolution into some other options. So one option is random search. Um, and that is where you just you say, you know, give me a hundred random experiments and let's see where I, where I land, where I land. Um, and that's certainly an option. The risk of overfitting is, uh, is lower with that um, than uh, doing a uh, full uh, beam search, but it's, um, it's, it's, it can be quite useful and it's certainly more efficient. So that's what led me to the genetic algorithm, which is how can I improve on random search? Um, and that is you know, pretty straightforward from a genetic algorithm uh, perspective, where with each generation, you only let the top experiments move on to the next generation. And I'll talk about this in, in greater detail. Um, but we're moving from uh, we're moving from specifying experiments to generating experiments, and then taking the output of those generating generated experiments in my generation two of my personal um, uh, growth uh, in this uh, to, um, to 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 trying to do actual machine learning on on figuring out what what parameter sets work well together. So the genetic algorithm basics, um, it's so simple, even I can figure it out. Um, remember, uh, Charlie mentioned that whole classics thing. Um, even I can do this uh, and the math is straightforward. Um, so the notion is you, uh, generation zero, you have uh, five experiments uh, with different um, settings. Uh, you run those against a specific, uh, against the algorithm of your choice. You're running it against notionally NDCG of 10. Um, for those different experiments, uh, you take the, you score them uh, and then you create generation one. So one option operation in genetic algorithms is crossover, where you take features of one with features of another and you create two, uh, two crossed over, crossover to, um, uh, experiments. Uh, and then you can mutate them. Uh, so you take features of one. So if you had uh, title and content in one um, in generation zero, you might remove a field or you might change the um, boost on one of those fields or some other way to mutate the features of, of that query. Uh, you can, you can uh, transfer those uh, directly over uh, into the next generation if you want. And the other thing is that you can um, prevent uh, poor performers from moving into the next generation and just create a new uh, random experiment. Uh, and by random, of course, it's uh, random of those, uh, those feature sets or those uh, uh, that, I, that I talked about earlier. Then you score those and then rinse and repeat um, where you can you randomly select some for crossover mutation, uh, carry through and then or just uh, create uh, new random um, random experiments until convergence or until uh, the heat death of the universe, uh, which can happen with some of these sometimes. All right, so how does this differ from learning to rank? Well, as um, Peter um, Dixon Moses pointed out to me um, after last time I gave this, this is a learning to rank and some of my thinking about this was um, inspired by an early learning to rank paper that talked about any machine learning that you use to figure out how to rank results. Um, this is quite different though from the modern day uh, solar elastic um, uh, use of learning to rank in that, uh, well, first the, the similarities, um, you still need sound engineering decisions. Your analysis chain has to match your data. It has to be a good fit for your data and for, for the queries. Um, you have to have ground truth and you have to go have good ground truth. The main difference between this and what we now use uh, as, a, as the phrase learning to rank in, uh, in Lucene uh, land, um, elastic and uh, solar land, is that this is meant for settings for that overall general initial search. It's not a re-ranking function on, on a subset of those, um, of those features. That said, it can certainly be adapted to be used in uh, systems that have uh, learning to rank and can be used in, in co coordination with learning to rank. Remember earlier, you could specify uh, which um, server you can send those queries to. You can also specify which handlers you want to use. And if you have a custom handler or um, other things that you can customize, you can specify those as features in, in running your experiments. So at this point, Generally, it's based. It's how, how well can we configure things for our general um, general baseline search in the system, given the huge number of parameters we have to play with. All right. The other thing that I did in generation two, um, and so that uh, was build in crossfold validation, uh, so that it's not something that uh, researchers have to reinvent. Um, it's and it's not something that you can get away from 
mostly, um, but it, it's built into it. You cannot run the genetic algorithm uh, without cross-fold validation unless you intentionally say, I only want uh, one fold. Uh, don't do that. Uh, so that's built into it, which is really nice. So that m makes the risk of overfitting much smaller. The other thing is it allows you to see that the, um, the variance across those different folds. So you get a sense of how fragile or how, um, what, what, what the variance is from those different folds. So you know that, well, it, it gives you a better um, sense of, of the reliability of those results on um, on, on new sets of data. Uh, so that you can say, oh, well, it'll work really well on some, it'll probably not work well on others. On average, we're probably doing better. Um, so cross-validation is really important. All right, so as we all know, and this, this slide probably isn't necessary for the folks in the audience, but for, for some of it's new, uh, here you go with cross-fold validation. The notion is you take a, a set, let's say here we have four, uh, you have a single data set um, at each iteration. You uh, set three of them as training, and then you test on the fourth. And then in the next iteration, um, it, yeah, so at fold zero, um, you train on the first three, you test on the fourth. So let's say we get um, NDCG at 10, you get 0.45. Um, fold one, test on those three, uh, I'm sorry, train on those three tests on that one and so on. So that you're you're making the most, you're making very efficient use of your data and you're getting a sense of what the variance is across the different experiments. So after you do that, you uh, take the average, uh, also of course standard deviation or at least variance or just eyeballing it is an important thing to do. Um, if you're only running one uh, experiment and you get a number, you think, oh, that's that's great, but you don't get a sense of, of the breadth uh, that, you, that you can get. Certainly um, our Monte Carlo methods and other ways are, and other methods are a good way of getting that sense of variance, but it's, it's really critical uh, to understanding um, how well you're doing and, and if you are actually improving in some meaningful way. The other key thing here is, is to report and talk about the average. Uh, I will admit at some place I worked um, there, I did have a colleague once who wanted to report only the best fold. Um, and I still shriek from that. Um, and I think we can all agree, <laughs> please don't do that. <laughs> All right, so what does this look like in practice? As I mentioned, this is all uh, command line. So when you're running it, you get um, fold zero, uh, what the training is. So this said um, that we ran a bunch of experiments on, um, on, on training. Those were the results we got. We applied um, uh, fold zero generation four experiment number two to the test data. Uh, and that is the value we got at the bottom, uh, 0.55. Um, and it's pretty common uh, to see uh, some variation. This, this data set that I'm using is uh, the data set that um, Open uh, Source Connections uh, and um, Doug and John put out. Uh, so it's a smallish data set. So you ex expect to see kind of these broad, huge variants um, from training to testing. In reality, you also see some things depending on how big your data set is and how uniform your data is. And then uh, for each, uh, you can also, um, uh, you, you'll get the roll up across that. So the experiment, the, the test for um, for the first, uh, for fold two was the highest, that was 0.79. The uh, test for fold zero um, was 0 0.55, 0 0.54, and then there's the median of 0.63. But you can see that the standard deviation or even just eyeballing uh, the variance is, is quite high for this little test set. All right, so initial findings. Uh, for one uh, client, I was able to boost their NDCG uh, 10 from 0.25 to 3. Um, given the amount of ground truth they had, I think that that was actually a meaningful uh, bump. Uh, so I was really happy with that. Um, the bad is that when you set, uh, when you have a, when you open up the entire parameter set and you don't run it long enough, uh, you can often do worse than uh, baseline or, or where people are starting from. But the great thing and the critical thing for me is whether or not I'm actually doing better. And I'll talk about this again in the next couple of slides. The key thing for me is that I'm no longer specifying experiments. Those are being generated automatically. I have a, a, a traceability for all of the experiments I did and all of the results I had. I can reproduce all of those experiments. And I can now, and I don't have to twiddle with those things. I don't have to go to bed at night and think, well, maybe PS3. PS3 is the key. I'm going to try that tomorrow. I don't care anymore because I can, I can try all of those things or the computer can try all of those things. And I can focus on more uh, fun things, uh, more you know, more advanced um, uh, feature engineering, single, signal enrichment, um, external signals, um, hopefully uh, getting some time to uh, spend with the dense vectors uh, and so on. So that's the key thing is that I'm not saying that this is the next cognitive blockchain that will revolutionize everything, but this does take care of a lot of the um, uh, plumbing kinds of tasks, the boring kinds of tasks uh, that we can do as uh, relevance engineers.
All right. Uh, the other uh, thing is that um, I, I would now, instead of, I'd like to move from p-values to l-value, which is if Jimmy Lin uh, said that uh, a, a difference was worth uh, reporting uh, in Twitter, uh, then I will also uh, report that and call that the l-value. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce that one again. Uh, if you don't want to use p-values, use l-values. All right, for this talk, I um, worked uh, with Nate, um, Nate Day at Open Source uh, Connections, uh, and thank you for the inspiration for this uh, little um, hopping in puddles uh, that I did, uh, and also for your collaboration uh, with the data and um, the design. Um, this is you know, publicly available data uh, when you sign, the, sign an agreement with them. Um, what I am presenting here is not final. It's not comparable with other teams. I'm not trying to sell anything. It's just I, we had the data around, and I, I ran with it to see what we could have. So this one is the background linking task, where there are 670,000 documents, 57 topics. And the notion is, if we given one document, find, the, uh, find documents that would be useful for background uh, for that. So um, it's effectively uh, more like this query. Um, so I added that to uh, Quirita uh, fairly recently so that I could uh, play around um, with these with this document set. So baseline, uh, if you just use uh, default uh, Elasticsearch more like this query on the content field, uh, you get normalized discount discounted cumulative gain at five of 0 0.038. Um, with the genetic algorithm, you <laughs> bump that all the way up to 0 0.416, which isn't a huge gain. Um, it certainly wasn't as large as the gain uh, uh, reported by uh, some folks at Trek. Um, one set of authors uh, went from baseline of 0.35 uh, to 0.55 when they started adding more exciting uh, features, uh, NLP on entity extraction. They did machine learning to um, measure the distance, uh, the semantic distance between um, uh, uh, article uh, categories. Uh, and then they also, of course, applied learning to rank uh, on these various things. Um, so they, and they, they saw a much bigger boost, um, but my results are not comparable. Um, but the key thing, again, for me is even if I didn't do a great job at Trek, I didn't have to spend time on those on all of the built-in uh, parameters that you can play with, that's taken care of for me. If I happen to do well or happen to get a boost in NDCG or something that's even meaningful, that's that's a side benefit and fantastic. But the key thing is that I've explored the parameter space, I'm comfortable with it, and I can now do the more fun things. Um, so um, Renee asked me uh, if, how, how well it scales. Um, this is a screenshot of my poor server. Uh, when I was launching uh, 20 threads of queries against the Elastic uh, cluster with Washington Post, um, 800,000 documents in it. Uh, and on the left is my little laptop. Um, as you can see, Firefox uh, is taking up more CPUs uh, than my little Java, um, little Java Quirita that's sending off all of those queries, getting back the results, and doing all of the uh, calculation. Um, so it, it scales fairly well. It does. It, you can hammer um, Elastic or Solar, uh, and I did find out that Elastic will not allow you to query more than a thousand uh, times concurrently. I think uh, maybe ten thousand. Um, so there are limits, uh, but those limits are um, are on the Solar and on the Elastic Search side. And as we all know, those systems are, are crazily robust. Um, so don't hammer your production server, but uh, you can do a fair amount of queries uh, fairly quickly with this. All right, so I'll be wrapping up a little bit early, hopefully leaving more time uh, for discussion uh, and um, for lunch or dinner, I guess, break quickly, depending on where you are in the world. Next steps, obviously, uh, documentation. Uh, I have some decent readmes, but uh, more documentation would be good. I'd like to add some uh, ground truth free measures. Um, so overlap and rank correlation, just so that if you don't have ground truth and you want to see how different a new, a new configuration would be from your baseline configuration, you can do that. One thing that really is I would why I want to have is explainability or interpretability. So let's say the genetic algorithm finds that this cluster of experiments does uh, does a better job. What features of those experiments um, mark them as different from everything else? Is it the fact that they relied mostly on the content field uh, versus um, the title field or something like that? Um, I could actually get around to integrating a, a grown-up um, Bayesian optimization uh, package. Um, at some point, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I want to because I think there's a lot more to be gained from learning to rank and some of the other methods, but I might. Um, outreach, uh, certainly talking to the uh, chorus folks um, and uh, somewhere they have connections to the open source. I can't remember the name of the company quite. Um, Anyways, uh, yeah, and uh, working with others, uh, whether it's to transfer the actual code or at least some of the ideas that uh, people find useful. And then maybe integration uh, to other uh, projects as, as possible. 
Um, my takeaways from this, uh, automate, 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 even automate the generation of experiments so that you don't have to sit there and twiddle with the different um, parameters that one can play with. Replicability, traceability, uh, statistical variance, significant statistical significance, all of these things are really important. Um, and let's continue to do what we're doing with those uh, across the field. So that's where we have questions. Um, if you want to see this live, I can try a demo. Um, we do have some time, uh, although I'll uh, defer to Charlie uh, if, if we want to go straight to questions uh, and off we go. Shall I go for a, a, a demo, quick demo? I, I think we bear in mind the time. It okay. might be best just to try some questions. Sounds great. Um, let's see how we get through the questions, maybe have a couple of minutes for a demo. Uh, totally thank good. you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Tim, fantastic stuff. Um, so, um, our first question comes <laughs> from um, somebody whose name you may recognize, Rene Kriegler. So yes. uh, we tried to reduce the number of configurations and parameter configurations to try out. Um, have you got any thoughts about reducing the number of queries? Uh, some of them might correlate uh, with optimal parameter values and metrics. Yeah, so, so that's another area uh, that I would like to, to build out is, is clustering on uh, query types to see if there are families that do well with different, um, with different configurations. Uh, obviously, the, um, the, the head queries are probably going to be different than the tail queries. And as, as we, we know, you know, people searching for shoes are the people searching for shoes are, and the people searching for, um, uh, for, for you know, other kinds of things are, are going to be looking differently. So the degree to which we can um, cluster those results, I think, think would help with that. Uh, in my experience, I haven't really had to decrease the number of queries because Elastic and Solar are so powerful that I can launch thousands of queries um, and it, it, it works in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but that certainly, uh, that certainly leads to a, a good point about um, about understanding the nature of your queries and, and potentially if you get a good signal from the different types of queries you have, as you know, um, and if you can do machine learning to do the categorization, um, then uh, that can be a really useful thing for, you know, get the query and do machine learning on what, what settings work best with that kind of query and, and ship that off. Um, but thank you, I, I hadn't thought about that. So that, that's just my, my little bit of rambling on, on how one might condense the queries. I, sorry, before I um, go, go on, what is mildly amusing to me is this is this overall process is very similar to what I'm doing um, on another uh, project, which I mentioned briefly at the beginning, where we're doing fuzzing on files. And the notion there is also, can you uh, decrease the corpus size and get the same results uh, so that you don't have to do all of that processing? Um, so it's fun to see uh, randomization uh, in another uh, field uh, being extraordinarily useful. Fantastic, thank you. So uh, Matteo asks, um, uh, actually, uh, yeah, asks, would you recommend your approach to optimize recall instead of uh, NDCG at K, uh, leaving the latter for re-ranking with learning to rank and other techniques? So yes, absolutely. And I, I, I didn't go into this, but there's a notion of different uh, categories of queries. Um, and uh, you could certainly use this to uh, uh, work on how you can improve recall across those categories so you get the, the good baseline and then leaving the rest for uh, learning to rank to, to pick up uh, with the precision. Um, what, I've, what I propose though is that um, you can also use learning to rank in this whole framework uh, instead of specifying what fields you can do. Um, you can say, I want to experiment with these fields, but also have uh, send it to this handler, which which uses learning to rank. Um, so you could put those together and see, am I in this same experimental framework uh, to see if you are doing better? Um, so yes, recall, baseline recall is where I was headed with this. Uh, and then yes, and precision as, um, as Trey was pointing out, uh, with uh, the more advanced methods um, uh, may, may, may help out quite a bit with the knowledge graphs and so on. Uh, so yes, completely. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Okay, so uh, then our next uh, question is uh, kind of the perfect question for an open source uh, maintainer. We have <laughs> uh, Edward asks, uh, how can we contribute to this work? Sure. I mean, the, so the easiest thing is uh, to use it uh, or look at it uh, and see what things you like about it. Uh, and if there are things you really like about it, go get the course people to to um, to put it into their system. <laughs> Uh, but seriously, um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so use it, um, break it. Uh, it is still hot off the press. It's still in alpha version. Um, I had to make changes uh, even as I was putting this talk together. 
um, but do do use it um, and and let me know uh, how it's working. Uh, if there are ways that I can prove it, I am now actively developing it uh, for current work. So I um, uh, I'm, I'm, I've gotten back into the code base, and it's easy for me to fix things. It took me a couple of hours to add the more like this query. Um, there are a number of other query types that I would like to add. So feedback, um, let me know on um, on GitHub or on Twitter or on any of the other uh, media. Uh, so feedback, feedback, and obviously pull requests, of course. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, Cedric asks, uh, thinking about enterprise search and the fact that types of users may have different objectives with the same query, would you recommend to create <laughs> one ground truth per user type or would you see a way to do it all at once? And he, he, he uh, appends uh, dreaming here. <laughs> Right. I mean, so as everybody said, it all depends, it, you know, it depends. Um, but seriously, if you have, I've worked with people with different, very different budgets uh, for what they can uh, pay for effectively, what they can afford in the complexity of the evaluation framework. Um, I've not worked in the e-retail, in, in the retail space uh, where um, search actually is, <laughs> I don't know what you do. Um, I've worked more in government and um, other places where it's important, but not, they, they just don't have the resources that a bunch of people in this meeting have available to them. So within, um, uh, within Quirated, there is a notion of a query set. And I put that in there so that you could have different personas, uh, so that you could optimize and look at, at those different personas. In my little example um, from the uh, TMDB uh, data uh, from Open Source Connections, um, Doug and John, um, there, there are clearly uh, queries that are, are title queries, and there are clearly titles that are actor queries. And having um, having a, a division and having those in two different sets, again, as I mentioned earlier, so hopefully when the queries come in, you can do automatic classification on them and then figure out how to boost them. Um, and if you have the resources to support that from an evaluation perspective and an implementation perspective, that would be the ideal world. And yes, we can all dream. Fantastic. That uh, That's the end of our questions. So uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you. Uh, we'll be taking a short break and we'll be moving on to uh, our last talk today, but thank you, Tim. Tim, Tim, who's possibly the only classically trained uh, rocket data scientist. I think that's what we can say now. But uh, thanks, Tim. And, thank you. Uh, we'll thank you all. Return with our last talk. All right. Thank you so much.